This is our continuation of a series of events that we've had over the past few years. It's a little bit like a coming full circle. Our first social change colloquium, which is about 11 or 12 years ago now, I'm forgetting which, involved people associated with the communes that, uh, in part, we'll talk here, Catherine Blinder was one of our first speakers, Tom Fells was another. And we've had an ongoing interest that whole period of time, off and on, bringing people who've spoken about their experience in history <coughs> of communal living in New England, and particularly in this little region, Massachusetts and Vermont, where there's so much depth of, of experience. Um, when I got a, a call from Raymond Mungo, I said, you should invite Yvonne Daly down here. I, I think within about 15 minutes, I sent off my first email, because if Raymond suggests someone, we, we always follow through. But. It's been remarkable the number of people we've had where we cross paths from Veranda Porsche and Raymond. Of course, they go together, but I, Whoops. but the dark screen over there yeah. uh, <laughs> has a wonderful photograph by Peter Simon, whose archives are here, of uh, Elliot Linder and Jenny Rose and, and a sheep whose name I'm, I'm forgetting entirely at the moment, but who is named in the book. Um, but Yvonne Daly has written this wonderful book on sort of, I guess, a history, and not memoir, but a history of the, her experiences and the experiences of people of the generation of the 1960s, of going back to the land in New England. Not an easy proposition for a bunch of city kids, uh, going back to an area where uh, culturally and geographically, climatically, it's a bit of a challenge. But with that, I'd like to welcome Yvonne Daly and, and have an opportunity to talk about about going into the country. Thank you. Okay, hi. So I'm going to give a little, um, just a few words and um, walk you through a slideshow of photos through the book. And then uh, tell you a little bit about how and why I did the book and then a little reading. We'll be about a half an hour. Okay? So, hopefully this will work. Theoretically, there we go. Okay. So, these folks are at um, Peter Simon, who's Kari Simon's brother, at his commune um, near Brattleboro. And um, they're all dressed up to go to Total Loss Farm for the May Day celebration. Obviously, this sign uh, shows the reason why so many people were involved in the anti-war movement and then left society and moved out to the country. Here I am in my hippie days. <laughs> I lived in a small town called Goshen in Vermont in the middle of the Green Mountain National Forest. This is the Goshen family. Four of my children are in this photo. And one, two, three, four of the people in this photo are no longer alive. These are the women that founded the second Women's Health Center. One of the reasons that this is here is because the women's movement was very strong in Vermont. Vermont was the third state to legalize abortion before Roe versus Wade. This is Senator Dick McCormick, now in his 70s. Um, he is a musician, obviously, and at some of our events, he's played a song called When the Hippies Move Next Door. This fellow, Oki, is famous in um, most of Vermont because he is bust by a state police officer named Paul Lawrence was well publicized. Paul Lawrence was a crooked cop. He, in turn, went to jail for planting drugs on the people he arrested. Andy Snyder here, who went on to be a state representative and worked for the state of Vermont. Um, this is from uh, an important cafe in the Rutland area, the Back Home Cafe. It was the meeting place of many hippies who lived out in the woods and didn't know one another until this place opened. This fellow, Rod Clark, was head of United Press International until he went to Earth People's Park, a very famous and contentious radical 
commune. Robert Horier um, is responsible for many of the organizations in Vermont about organic food, the farmers markets. This is at his commune in the northeastern part of the state. Mary Mathias, who now lives in Brattleboro, was his wife at the time. They farmed with horses. The more rudimentary, the better. <laughs> this uh, photo is from Middlebury College, which was very active in the anti-war movement, came to it a little bit late at that time. Vermont Governor Jim Douglas was uh, head of the Republican Party on campus, and he was the only one that protested when they closed down the campus. He wanted his tuition back. I'm a little behind. These folks are from Red Clover Commune in Putney, all radicals. And this woman, Barbara Nolfi, which this commune was in the northwestern sector of Vermont. Red Clover and Earthworks got together and created Free Vermont, a great movement. Here's the folks from Total Lost Farm, and the guy with the cap with his head down like that, that's our Ray Mungo. Veranda Porsche on the right. There's a poet here. You should check out her poetry. These folks established the first, or uh, the second, all vegetarian restaurant in Vermont. It was in the capital. And many of the senators and the legislators had their first tofu at that restaurant. Do you recognize this guy? Here's Bernie Sanders being sworn in as the mayor of Burlington. Uh, this fellow owns a very um, a, a store in Woodstock, Vermont today. He was at a commune called the Baloney Brothers. He rented from Lawrence Rockefeller, who didn't think much of him renting from him. Uh, Melinda Moulton, uh, an advocate of LSD, and um, the person responsible for the rehabilitation of the Burlington waterfront today. Susan Leader and her brother Michael, their father was part of the Nearing Project in Jamaica, Vermont, which was an early communal movement with four settlements along uh, Pikes Falls. Irving Fisk, there's a chapter in the book on the Quarry Hill Commune. The most salacious chapter in the book, if you're looking for such things. He orchestrated many sexual relationships between people and had relationships with many of the women on the commune. Here they are, here's a group of them. You see there's a lot of babies. If you were pregnant or by nursing, you were holy. Many of the people in that picture are partly closed. We went through it quickly. This is <laughs> Lady Belfisk, his daughter. The commune is still in existence. There's six existing communes today in Vermont and many new experiments starting. I'm sure you recognize these fellows. Here's Ben and Jerry. And they came to Vermont sort of towards the end of the counterculture movement and were really the recipients of the good luck of being there. This is the garage where it all started and uh, it's now should be on the national monument, right? <laughs> I'm going to speak a little bit, if we have time, on um, about this photo. So um, the woman is now a superior court judge and very well known. Kathleen Cole, this woman right here. Um, this is the Fisher family farm in north in the Northeast Kingdom. This is this special part of Vermont. She's a very celebrated artist nationally. This is Johnson Pasture. This is a sad story here. People died on this commune. There's two photos from it. Um, this, a candle was knocked over in the middle of the night. The building went up on fire and people died. The rules were no illegal drugs, no more pets, no soap in the stream, no picnickers, but visitors welcome. And more than a thousand people passed through there for the brief period of time it was there. Steve Early is the person responsible for closing down Middlebury College. 
He became a labor activist and has worked with Bernie Sanders over the years on the West Coast. Patrick Farrell, Mia Farrell's brother, um, made that sculpture there. It's called The Leash. Really, those are lights going across. There is no leash. Um, he had an art gallery in Vermont. This woman and her husband were back to the Landers early on. They made everything from scratch, grew their own food. When they had their children, they moved down to Bennington from Upper State, Vermont, and now they've moved back and have returned to that very rudimentary life. I wish I could leave this one on longer and maybe we'll bring it up. This is a poem by Allen Ginsberg about socialist snow in Burlington, Vermont. This is Goddard College, the epicenter of the counterculture movement in Vermont, and it's towards the Northeast um, Kingdom as well, maybe in the Kingdom. Um, Aldred French also became a state legislator, senator. Uh, he's a horticulturist now, long history in his town. These folks, the Gottlieb, were responsible for completely transforming Vermont's social services network. And one of the things that I want to talk about is how the common culture impacted Vermont. This woman, uh, Sass Potter, is now working with the United Nations on the migratory health, uh, on the health of the migratory tri tribesmen of Mongolia. Wayne Turiansky had a shop in Rutland called uh, The Emperor of Ice Cream. Discovered you could make money with t-shirts. He's now a multi-millionaire with his company. This is Peter Schumann. Have any of you heard of Bread and Puppet Theater in the northern part of Vermont? So he founded that. It was at Putney for a while and then it went to Glover. This photo is from the museum there. It's full of these huge puppets that need 6, 10, 12 people to man. Very political. The Vermont Historic Society followed the counterculture and had meetings all over Vermont and they had an exhibit. And um, some of the next photos are from that. This one. This is the cover of the Free Vermont newspaper, which was published statewide and offered advice um, to the new people coming up to Vermont. You'll see a page from it. Throughout, it's reminding people that people have lived here for a long time and to respect the local people. So it was a way for people to find about uh, what was going on, to meet one another as well. And here is my husband and I, a little bit later in the 70s. So, I need my book. First, a definition, counterculture, a way of life and set of attitudes opposed to or at variance with the prevailing social norm. And the example given in the dictionary, the idealists of the 60s counterculture. So um, one of the things I want to say, because I always forget <coughs> it till everybody has left, <coughs> that in the book, <laughs> It's a playlist at the back of the book, organized chapter by chapter of songs to listen to with each chapter. I'm saying that first because I always forget to say it. That's one of my favorite parts. So, why this book? Um, my friend Kathy Roberts, who's a librarian and a book collector in Burlington, about six years ago sent me a little book about the counterculture experience in Taos, New Mexico. And um, it was a very disturbing book. It was full of violence, shootings, people being burned out. And as I was reading it, oh, by the way, she tucked a little note into the book 
that said, you should do this book in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So as I'm reading it, the seed has been planted. Um, I'm just reflecting on my own experience in Vermont, which was so different. Vermonters were at first very suspicious of why all of these kids, many of them from the suburbs, college graduates, lots of opportunity, were coming to the country to live in fallen down shacks and old farmhouses and camps at first. But Vermonters are also very nosy. They're quiet, but they're nosy. And sooner or later, someone would show up at your door, or they'd see that your chimney was built the wrong way, or for some reason, they would want to get to know you. And that, in turn, would turn into they saved you from burning the house down, having your crops freeze in the winter. We were totally clueless, most of us, myself included. I moved to Vermont in 1967 from graduate school. I might read that section. Um, we were clueless about country living, most of us. You have to understand that Vermont in the late 60s, in the mid 60s, and throughout the 70s was extremely rural mostly dirt roads, very strong accents, almost indecipherable in some places. Most, many people did not have telephones. Television reception was in and out. When you did have a telephone, as I did, you were on a party line. <laughs> and the town gossip was on my line. <laughs> yeah. So it was a very different place. At many times in the history of Vermont, Vermonters had resisted people coming up into the state. There was this idea of keeping Vermont pure. At one time, there was a lot of federal money for highways all through the United States. And it was going to be a big road built along the ridge line of the Green Mountains. And Vermonters turned it down at town meeting day overwhelmingly, even though it meant millions of dollars coming into the state. Why? They didn't want people from Massachusetts and New York moving in. Okay, some of this, I must tell you, was anti-Semitism, anti-educated people, all sorts of not so pleasant things. When 93 and 89, the two interstate roads were built, that argument was over because people were coming up. So another reason that I was interested in this subject is that David Talbot, the founder of Salon Magazine, wrote a book called The Season of the Witch. And it explores um, San Francisco, the epicenter really, as we think of it, of the counterculture movement from the summer of love to the AIDS epidemic. It's, again, like that New Mexico book. It's a dark book. You think you're opening it up. You think you're going to read about all these hippies and peace and love. Murders. These won't mean a lot to the younger people, but some of you might remember the Zodiac Killers, the Zebra Killers, Charles Manson, the People's Temple, the killings of uh, Moscone and Milk. Okay, that resonates with some of you. So I'm reading this book, and again, I'm thinking about our experience. No state was affected more by the counterculture than Vermont. No state. In every way that you can measure it. Food, women's rights, the courts, politics, art, the economy, business, in every way. What Vermont needed most in the 1960s was young people. The state had been losing population for decades. And in came all of these young people. What, at the same time, the <coughs> old timers children were not really interested in country life at that time. They wanted the jobs and the life that we were leaving. They weren't interested in learning how to use a loom or which wood would be best to burn or how to can your vegetables. We were interested in all of that because we wanted to go back to the land. 
We wanted a participatory form of government. We felt left out of government in the 1950s and the 60s. Why? Because the average person was left out then, right? But that participatory form of government was waiting for us in Vermont in the form of town meeting. In Vermont, on the first Tuesday in March, every town votes. And many towns still have open town meetings where the business of the town, the budgets, election of offices, is done together. Now, when I moved there in the late 60s, 1967, this town I moved to in Goshen, under High Back Mountain, in the middle of the Green Mountain National Forest, into a big old 200-year-old farmhouse that I got for $75 a month. 75 acres, imagine that today, right? So the town had these four warring families. And you would go to town meetings, someone would have had too much to drink, someone would get into a brawl, someone would bring up something that happened 80 years previously that they were still fighting about. It was wonderful to participate in this. So at first people a little bit standoffish to you, but I had a little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that I had used when I was in college because I worked worked, there was no money involved, for a publication called Broadside Magazine, which some of you might remember. And this chronicled the folk music era. So some of us, a handful of us, <clears throat> were given these big tape recorders, reel to reel, 3M, you remember these tapes, and you would record a concert and interview Josh White or Odetta or Bob Dylan even. Um, and you would send off your tape and a little story to Broadside Magazine that would appear in the magazine. So when I moved to Goshen, I still had that tape recorder. And there were ancient people to me, probably my age now, living in the town who had these fabulous stories. Old families, and I wanted their stories. So I would show up after a little introduction with my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And people wanted to tell your story. And then they wanted to know yours, because they were curious about us. And I think this really helped me. And everyone has, maybe not the exact same story, but a similar story of how they got to know the locals. My third year in Goshen, I was a justice of the peace. <laughs> yeah. So I got to you know, tally the votes. I knew who voted for whom in uh, the next elections. So when I say that no state was impacted more than Vermont by the counterculture, that impact went both ways. So the local residents, as I said, were very generous to us and helped us. I think I'll read a little excerpt from uh, Robert Hurrier and Mary Mathias, who had this um, commune way up in the Northeast Kingdom. Back then, it was the end of the universe. And um, it was called Frog Run because um, they had built a sugar shack to make maple syrup, but they were so late gathering in the syrup and were boiling it up that a farmer stopped by and said to Robert, oh, you're making the frog run. That means the frogs are coming out of their hibernation, and he was at the very end of the season. They liked the name, and so they adopted it. Oops, that's not it. Here we go. So Robert Horier had written a, an article for the New York Times about a commune in Pennsylvania where everyone was run out of town. And his article got so much attention, <coughs> seven uh, publishers wrote to him and asked him to write a book about the counterculture movement. And it became the Bible 
of uh, the beginning of the movement because many people used it to go from commune to commune. You all know what a commune is, right? Younger people. Uh, yeah? It's a collective of people living in a house together. Um, as they traveled across the country. So they went to the Northeast Kingdom to write this story. The reaction to the new, uh, to write a book that they were asked to write about the communes in the United States. The reaction to the New York Times article was swift and positive. Nine literary agents offered to represent Robert Poirier if he would write a book about the commune movement. He quit his job and moved with his wife, Mary Mathias, to a small parcel of land they had purchased two years previously in the Northeast Kingdom town of Derby. Their initial reason for choosing that particular property had not been political. Horier loved to fish for walleye pike. He had read that the small deep lakes of the kingdom were famous for walleye. Their first winter living in a camp on Little Salem Lake with a three-year-old daughter and newborn son, without electricity, telephone, or running water, they discovered their lake had more salmon and lake trout than pike. With no money coming in, quote, we had lake trout or salmon every night, Matthias recalled, each more meal more delicious than the previous. This is a quote from Mary. Beginning that first year, we had that experience of how the land influenced us more than we influenced it, and the local people, who were so much smarter than we were, influenced us as well, Matthias recalled. The first person we met was a 15-year-old named Albert, who just showed up and sat there on his bike. I asked, how you doing? And he said in a strong, almost indecipherable accent, just came to see who you folks were. I invited him in. He declined and then asked, want some help with that wood pile? You built it wrong. He tore the wood pile apart and built one that wouldn't fall down. Next thing he told us was, well, you know, the way you got your chimney, you're going to have trouble when the wind is coming from West Charleston. He was right. He and Robert got up on the roof, made the chimney higher, and it worked just fine. He knew all the stuff we didn't know. One time, I was distressed because I didn't have an oven. Next day, he shows up with a tin box. Here's your oven, he said, and set it on top of the wood-burning stove. You could bake anything in it. He adopted us. You see how it goes? And this story is repeated over and over in this book. This book contains the narratives of about 140 people woven into 10 chapters that look at those broad subjects that I mentioned earlier. I thought I'd read you a little bit from the introduction, and then I really hope that we could have a conversation. And you might ask some questions. How does that sound? Like some, oh, this is not a memoir, but I am in the introduction a little bit and at the end. Okay, so this is a little bit of my story. Like so many of my generations born at the end of World War II, I had missed the deprivation, rationing, and closeness to the casualties of war that defined my older siblings' childhood. You know, we don't think about that today is that during World War I and World War II in particular, families, there was all of the, a lot of the food went to the military. <coughs> you couldn't get butter for one thing, right? And no sugar. So I grew up, and I was born at the end of the war, but my four siblings, they had grown up in that time. And that demarcation, 1945, that's the 50s, 
and then the baby boomer is after World War II. Until my mid-teens, life was defined by Catholic school and church, an Irish-Italian neighborhood, the comfort of the middle class in the suburbs of Boston. Out there somewhere, there were beatniks, un-American activities trials, racism and deep misogyny, the Cold War and its fanaticisms, all of which I was fairly aware of in the insulation of family, church, school, and neighborhood. And then seemingly overnight, the world changed. Suddenly we were alive in it. As of each morning we woke to news of death, not just the deaths of our heroes, and by our heroes I mean President Kennedy, his brother, and Martin Luther King. But soon the deaths of former classmates, of brothers and sisters, neighbors and strangers, dead in a foreign <coughs> country, fighting an ill-defined enemy, and the deaths and beatings of black people demanding the basic rights of citizenship, and white college kids working for the black cause. So many adults and children, some much younger than us, murdered in church basements, on back roads in the south, at Kent State University in Oakland, California. And so despite all our parents and our teachers and religious leaders had done, to try to protect us with generations before us, death came to define us. Our fathers really spoke of their war, but in retrospect, we see that it was always present, as present in their silence as it was in their sudden angers and nightly cocktails. We grew up on military parades and trips to monuments to war, on TV shows, where the settlers were the good guys and the American Indians the savages, on movies that celebrated valor and martyrdom, in which Americans were always victorious and the hero came home. But the names on the plaques in our city halls and the memorials in the town park were all for fathers and brothers who did not come home, who died often young to make us safe. These were other generations' wars, not ours. And even though in school we practice how to survive a nuclear and atomic war, ducking and covering under our desks, by the time we read John Hershey's Hiroshima, are you reading that? Any of you? Required reading in many high school and college curricula, we knew survival after nuclear war would require more than acting like a turtle. Wouldn't putting all that effort into preventing war be a better approach for humankind? Thus, when it came to our generation's war and our unprepared brothers and friends being sent to battle in far away jungles, it seemed impossible, a bad dream. Disconnected from our safe and pampered lives, something that happened on TV or the movie screen, not with us in battle. We wondered where this Vietnam was anyway, and why we were at war with the Vietnamese people. This too, the seeming senselessness of the Vietnam War, against a people who had done us no harm, defined us. It made us question our government, and by default, our parents and society itself. So this is at the core of the anti-war movement, of, of the common culture movement. Prior to the, to the war, many college kids, young kids, had gone to the South to register voters. They primarily gone to Mississippi. During one summer, Freedom Summer, thousands of young people went to Mississippi to register black voters. And I don't remember the numbers, but quite a few were murdered. There's been a new movie out about it. And the anti-war movement really grew out of the effort to um, end racism in America. And the move to the country came from that. The counterculture movement 
really began in cities. It began in Greenwich Village. It began in San Francisco. It began in Chicago. Chicago, uh, the University of Chicago, where Bernie Sanders graduated from, uh, was where CORE was founded, the Congress, Congress for Racial Equality. Thank you. Um, now, at one point, the cities really became unsafe. And that's when people started moving to the country. But at first, they had no reason to be in the country other than to get out of the city. And then they began to find their reason. Throughout Vermont, there was a connection made by those people that were part of the Free Vermont between the war in Vietnam and inequality and poverty that your money was going to the war machine and not taking care of people. And the early people that came here to Vermont, the counterculture folks, really worked to create free health clinics for you know, anyone to come for health care. And find it, founding food co-ops, they opened these up to lots of people. And this is really how the blending of old and new happened in Vermont. Because as I said, the, what Vermont needed most was young people, right? It needed young people, but not to you know, go and live off by yourself in a commune so much as you needed young people to integrate into society and become teachers. Right? and get to know their neighbors, and volunteer on rescue squads, and volunteer fire departments. These are the very way that government and society works to this day in Vermont. It's a sparse population. There's not a lot of money there. You're not going to make a lot of money there, unless you move to Burlington and you're lucky to get one of those jobs. But it's still a very poor and rural state. Right now, what Vermont needs most, again, is young people. We're the second oldest state in the Union. Maine is the only state that's older of its population than Vermont. So many people are hoping, and it's starting to happen, that we will have another back to the country movement. So I think I won't read any more. I'll tell you about a couple of the people that, that I wrote about. And then I'd like to open it to the comments and questions. Um, Patty Whalen, she was the woman with the man with the pitchfork, Superior Court judge. So um, she had gone to a Catholic college in, uh, in and around uh, Pennsylvania and moved to a commune in Vermont and then got her own place out in the country with her husband. And she was feeling, beginning to feel, what am I going to do with my life? Why am I here? And one night, in the middle of the night, um, a neighbor, a woman, knocked on her door. Her husband had hurt her. He was threatening to kill the children. Patty took the family in, the children and the woman, and the next morning she got on the phone and she started looking for a woman judge to help this woman. I mean, a woman lawyer, pardon me. She couldn't find one. There were no women lawyers in Vermont. Patty got her purpose. Vermont College, of, uh, the Vermont Law School, had just opened up, and she became one of its first students. She didn't study business law. She studied family law. And she didn't go and work for a you know, high-powered law firm. She went to work for legal aid in the Brattleboro area. And she began to see that the way that the court system was set up, that when there were problems in a family, the court was part of the problem. Okay? If couples separated, the last thing they dealt with was child support. And it was $25 a month. How could someone exist on that? And there was no place for someone who felt unsafe to go. There were no shelters for women. 
or men or children that might be being abused. There was no family court system. More times than not, the woman got the children, the man was out of the relationship, so children were not growing up with the father in their lives, and she saw these things. And working in legal aid, she started working with lawyers and judges and the legislature all over the state to try to rectify the situation. And over the next 10, 12 years, all the laws and conditions now that deal with family court in Vermont were created. Madeline Cunin, Vermont's first and only female governor, was elected. Um, and she started naming women judges. And one of the first people she called was Patty Whalen. Patty said, I'm not qualified to be a judge. And Lynn ben, Liz Bankowski, who was um, Madeline Cunin's associate, said, well, you're the most qualified pe person we know. And um, so she became one of the first Vermont judges. And again, working with the legislature, police, um, continued to advance family court. One day, she got a phone call from The Hague. You all know what The Hague is, the consortium of of countries that have treaties together. I think it's 73 countries, but it's something like cool. They needed someone to help them create treaties for how to deal with children from parents who were living in different countries, perhaps divorcing, separating, or at least apart. She helped write those laws. Then, after the war in the former Yugoslavia, they needed a court system. They called her in, and she helped create that court system. When I interviewed her, she said it was everything I learned in Vermont that helped me to do that, because we're not fancy. Judges do everything. If it's raining and the window needs to come down, we're the ones that will do it if we're the only ones there. We know how to do everything. Um, she brought uh, over the first women judges from Afghanistan to visit Vermont's court system to see how it worked. She continues to work in all of these ways. This is the what I think <coughs> what is so important about the story in Vermont because it shows that the average person with values can find a way to make a difference. We are all today feeling like we can't make a difference in this world, that we're out of control, that it's all gonna happen whether we do anything or not. But over and over in, in my book, and I believe that there are, there are examples of this everywhere, but these are the ones I've written about. There are stories of people who came here very idealistically in the late 60s and the 70s, lived in a community, worked in that community, found a way to work with people who might be of a completely different political persuasion, but through common cause. What do you need? We need to get this road plowed. We need to put out this fire. We need to bring some business into our town. We need to teach our children. They made a difference in their town, and many of them have taken it all over the world. So. That's my story. Thank you. So I hope you have questions and comments and your own experiences. Your, your, thank you for coming first. Your story really rings true. Um, my parents in the 70s had a place in Vermont right outside Mount Escutney. And um, the party line was really funny because my, my father commenting, saying he was talking to somebody on the phone, and the person hung up, and then he heard somebody else hang up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, uh, and he had a farmer down the street who did the driveway, and wouldn't take any money for it. He's doing driveway, he didn't care who the owner was, just that's what he did. And it's great. Now you have a lot of the archives of the 70s here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot from the Wannigan Farm down in Massachusetts, but right. also Total Loss Farm, 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 Farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Liberation News Service as well. Liberation News Service goes on and on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
maybe we'll talk about that later. I'm really grateful to be here as part of that. Thank you. I meant to say that first off, but of course I was nervous. <laughs> Along those lines, is somebody's got to start. I right? other than dance, but I, I'm curious whether you know one of the things that stands out to me is that some, a number of these companies have survived, and persisted in one form or another. And I'm curious whether there's you have anything to offer on what it is that makes some of these experiments survive and others not so much. Well, curiously, Quarry Hill, the one that I said um, Irving Fist uh, was in you know, charger or whatever, he was the big daddy. And um, that is still in existence today. He has died. When he died, there was a, what they called a big divorce and a lot of them left because he had a lot of charisma and people would follow him but they weren't going to follow his children or the same age as them. Um, but there's 64 people living there now. Okay, that's a pretty sizable community. Um, why live there? Companionship, like values, it's cheap, <laughs> right? Um, and commonality. Uh, I don't think they have nightly meals together anymore. For a long time they ran a school, but that also closed. Now um, there's these co-housing projects that are beginning and there probably are some in Massachusetts. And that sort of co commune meets something else. There's one in Burlington that was begun by people that, Barbara Nolfi, the woman, the woman that was at the Earthworks commune. So they're senior citizens now. They have their own apartments in a communal building. So there's a huge kitchen, there's a huge library. And they eat together a couple of days a week, but they have their own privacy. So that's, you know, a good thing. Um, there is a new commune uh, at Philo, which, Mount Philo, which was the site of an old commune. So, you know, I think that economics, companionship, shared values, shared work are the four reasons. Yeah. Yvonne, didn't um, some of the Housing rules at Quarry Hill change. Yeah. Explain that if you will. Well, because there used to be. Right. After the big divorce, before the big divorce, you had no uh, ownership of your house. So somebody might move into a shack and turn it into a house, right? And have invested a lot of money into it. And um, when Irving died, people became very insecure about their investments all of these years into their property. And by then, many had families. They weren't living this vicarious back and forth to all these one another. So um, uh, they brought a lawsuit against Quarry Hill. And the end result is that people who had been there a long time got a certain allotment from the whole of the value of the property. and now. Anything that you, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but if you have a house and you improve it, those improvements get noted and you're supposed to get money for it. I think it's still rather dicey. <laughs> yeah, the place was always kind of dicey to be, to be clear. But the fo folks at the New Hamburger, which is still in existence in Plainfield, this was um, a commune that was really dedicated to helping immigrants. They helped immigrants from, from Vietnam, from Cambodia. They were helping immigrants long before we heard about people needing sanctuary, right? In the, uh, like, uh, the Muslim um, refugees now. And um, they bought the property from a farmer. He held the lease for a long time. It's paid off now. Everyone owns their own house, but the land is owned communally. Now, one of the people that I interviewed about that commune is the son of people who he grew up at the commune, but he has no ownership of it or of, of you know, actually they don't own the house. They own what's in the house. So he says, well, what is my legacy? He believes in it, but still I think there's a little bit of, you know, 
can I come back and live there when I want to retire? That's it. I think there are new communes starting up. Are there any around here that any of you know of? There's one in Northampton. I wouldn't call it a commune exactly, but it's a common kind of thing. And there is one, excuse me? A collective? Well, I don't know if I'd call it that, but there are people that get together, they all own their own property. Uh -huh. There's one starting in Amherst, sort of inspired by the one in When I was in Chittenden for a reading last week, a young woman lives on a collective. Um, everybody, own, the land is owned together and everyone owns their own home. We're a little bit more judicious about legal issues and money now than in the 60s. Because you could live on next to nothing back then. I mean, you know, it's remarkable how expensive life became in a short period of time. I always say that the fuel embargo in the mid-70s had much to do with it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, could you uh, speak a little bit about uh, Earth People's Park? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, Earth People's Park was purchased with money collected at Woodstock and other music festivals. And two parcels of land were purchased with that money, one um, in Berkeley and one in Norton, Vermont, which is colloquially called the last left in Vermont, because if you keep going left, you're in Canada. Um, and it was inhabited by people who wanted to get away for one reason or another, socially, uh, because they were wanted by the law, because they were draft dodgers, for any number of reasons. Uh, you saw, saw the photo of Roy Clark as the UPI bureau chief of Vermont, United Press International. He went there to do a story, wrote the story, was fascinated, called his editor a couple of weeks later and said he wanted to go back. His editor said, you were just there. No. Well, Rod went anyhow and didn't bother coming back to work. And he lived there for a couple of years, and then he moved to the nearby town of Norton. Um, so the land, or someone on the land, was busted for drugs in the 80s, I think, the late 80s. And under federal law, the federal government then owned the land. But they gave it to the state of Vermont, and it's now of People's Park. It belongs to the people of Vermont. It's a state park. Yeah. It's really scrubby there. I went with Roy Clark uh, as in the 80s. I did a long series on the color culture for the Rutland Herald, where I was working at the time. And I wanted to go to Earth People's Park, and I had heard that there were a lot of outlaws living there. And so I didn't want to go by myself. And I asked Rod to go with me, and Rod said, sure, I'll go with you if you'll drive and we could stop at all my favorite brewer, uh, beer joints along the way. Now, Rod has written many things, including A Beer Drinker's Guide to Vermont. <laughs> He's deceased, I'm sorry. Um, just a great guy. Okay, so we stopped at all these bars. He had a drink, I drove. And we got there, and we went in, and it was this amazing thing, because a baby was born while we were there. And so I'm trying to rush back to get the story. No, no, no. Well, the story had to wait because we had to um, stop on the way back, too. But I think the most important thing I wanted to tell you was as we drove out of Earth People's Park, he's in the passenger seat, and he reaches into his belt behind his back, and he pulls out a gun. And he didn't tell me he had it all that time. And I said, I thought you said we'd be safe. And he said, always taking precautions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had a wonderful um, interview with Rod not long before he died. And his story on Earth People's Park is in the book. Yeah. So many details about living in Norton, Vermont. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. I was up there. Uh two weeks ago, so I found out it was now a state park. 
in Vermont, and they allowed uh, uh, wilderness camping. So I went up to my motorcycle intending to camp out, and I uh, found out you couldn't drive a vehicle, motorized vehicle, onto the property. Uh -huh. So I was scouting out a campsite. I was there about 10 minutes, and uh, the Border Patrol showed up because it is, it's Canada, right? Right there. Right there. And asked, what are you doing here? Uh, why are you here? Where are you from? And you can't stay here. And yeah. I said, I don't want to cause any trouble, so I left. But my intention is to go back up and look for uh, remnants and artifacts and do some nice. photography. Uh, send me an email and I'll put you in touch with some folks from there okay. that okay. know a lot about it. Yeah. But you're bringing up an interesting subject which has nothing to do with our subject. But I was in Newport for a reading. Newport is also looks at Canada um, across the lake. And um, I heard lots of stories about how it's changed um, immigration and how people that, you know, there's towns along the border. There's, Chuck, what town is it where the library is Derby. often have? Derby line. Derby. Yeah. Derby. Yeah, you step across the line and you're in Canada in the middle of the library. That's and that people, you know, used to go back and forth with very little concern or, you know, they know the Border Patrol fellows and women. But that's all changed. That's. Yeah. Well. Um, I think you should talk a little bit about the last chapter in your book. Oh, okay. Um, because yeah. you've talked a lot about, you know, what uh, what has come out of right. out of this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the last chapter in the book is the children of the counterculture, and um, that was sobering. Um, a lot. Uh, so I interviewed quite a few people who had grown up on communes and in communal situations. Um, I would say more than a third, maybe half, of felt that their parents had been selfish, that they were children themselves, that they shouldn't have had children. In the 70s, many marriages of the people that moved to Vermont, of many people that were married in the 60s and the early 70s broke up because back then if you wanted to live with somebody, you pretty much got married. Yeah, people did not live together the way they do now. So people were marrying in their early 20s before they were grown up and they'd wake up one day and go, huh, what am I doing here? Women tended to stay in Vermont and a lot of the men left. So four of the people that I interviewed grew up not knowing their fathers, except for occasional visits. And they were angry about that. And each and every one of them said, when I decided to have children, I made sure that I had lived with uh, the mother and that we were committed. And regardless of what happened, I'm always going to be in my parents' life. Uh, Sass Carey's son, um, thinking on his name. He carves instruments, the most amazing didgeridoos and all of these beautiful instruments at his in Bridgewater, Vermont. He's got a studio there. He's of a different set of minds. He felt that he belonged more to his parents' generation. He's anti-materialistic. He embraces all of the values of the 60s. So his story is different. So there's a mix of that. The girl that I interviewed, the young woman that I interviewed that grew up on Quarry Hill said that as a result of growing up in that very tight and rule-less environment, she didn't know how to make commitment. She didn't learn how to make commitments. And she didn't really learn how to go against the group think because the group think was so strong. I found that those interviews for me were really interesting. But there's a mix. Una Adams, who is Veranda's daughter, grew up between Total Loss Farm, which was founded by the people that ran the Liberation News Service, which was like an Associated Press of the anti-war movement. 
and her father, who was a musician, and he lived in Marlboro. So she went between the commune and Marlboro, <coughs> Vermont. So she had um, a small city life or a town life of artists there, and then Total Loss Farm artists and writers on the commune. And she didn't have any of those issues that uh, the people that grew up in the families that broke apart had. Yeah. Um, so the, the com community that you were a part of, I'm, I'm interested in sort of, so where, where did the people come from? Was it certain like, colleges? I, I, or? My, my house mm -hmm. was not a commune, okay. but it operated communally, uh -huh. mm -hmm. as did everybody in North Goshen. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ate meals together, we had an electric mixer, <laughs> we had a rototiller, you know, so it was all the shared things. But your question is, how did they operate? Or, or, or how, did, how did they come together? I mean, were they Some the people knew one another from college. Mm -hmm. Some people met at demonstrations. Um, one of them grew out of um, anti-nuke demonstrations. You're back. <laughs> um, the folks at Ray Clover were associated with the Weathermen Underground and the Black Panthers. And so they were very political. And they ran a film project um, where they went to Vietnam illegally and tried to interview Ho Chi Minh during the Vietnamese War. and. Uh, Grace Paley went with them, the writer Grace Paley. And so they thought of the, they were always getting, you know, uh, the FBI would come into their house and harass them, their apartments in Greenwich Village. John Douglas had bought a property in Putney, and they thought they'd be safe from the FBI there. One time he came back from New York and the FBI met him at the bus station. <laughs> so they were keeping track of him. Yeah, several of the Weathermen Underground hid out there. Bernadette Dorn for one of them. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you mentioned that, that um, the cities had become unsafe. I mean, was some of that because of protest activity or like... So what was the unsafe well, part of the Well, you know, there cities? were many things. There was a lot of racial strife. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you think of San Francisco, how demonstrators were getting beat up all the time. Hippies were getting beat up all the time. It was that sort of thing. Yeah. But I should say that there were many communes that were just organized around living cheaply, living together, growing your own food, uh, frog run, if you could do something but as rudimentary as possible, the better. Okay, I, they, they farmed with horses. And local people taught them how to buy old harnesses and fix them up and how to take care of their animals. After a while, they were coming then to the farms and doing farm work with their horses. And this is how this happened. So there was the whole gamut of possibilities. Many people met at rock concerts, and they would say, well, there's this place up here in Vermont, you want to come up here, it's beautiful, and it's cheap, and you can bunk in, and that's, certainly Woodstock was big because a lot of people just kept going north. And the Newport Folk Festival was another place where people gathered together. I, I moved to this house in Goshen. I met people at Newport from San Francisco. One day, friends of theirs show up at my house. <laughs> A year later, I show up at their house. This is, you know, was this period of time. As I said, it was cheap to travel and get around and live. It was reasonable. I wish we would get back to that. Yes, hi. Hi. So was your intention from the get-go to always be a journalist? When you, when you were in Isn't college, that an that interesting that question? Your, yeah. I say I, I, um, I became a journalist because 
I am the youngest grandchild in my fa family, and my family is very secretive. So they had things they didn't want anyone to know, but they all knew a little bit because they were born before me. So I became very adept at asking questions as a young child. I always wrote, no, I thought I'd write the great American novel, don't we all? <laughs> but single mother, five kids, got to get a job. Actually, I'm at that point. Um, did I always want to be a journalist? The next book I'm writing is called My First Murder. And it's about the first murder that I covered, not the first murder I did. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Because um, you, you mentioned you were in grad school. What, what, yeah, what master's in philosophy. Okay. Very useful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but our, that murder was the day that I said, this is the job for me. You can't make this stuff up. It was the most, I mean, it had everything, you know, all in one case. And, I untangled it, you know, three or four hours. It took the police a couple of weeks. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like talking to people. Yeah, I like people's stories. And I have a round face. People trust you when you have a round face. Well, why don't we uh, have snacks? Thank you. saying that we have other events coming up. Uh, two weeks from today, we have our friend Sigmund Schmaltzer talking about her new book. She's a historian of science in China. A uh, really good person, really wonderful person. And two weeks after that, on uh, November 4, uh, sorry, November 1, uh, one month, four weeks from today, we have Alan Young talking about his oh. memoir, uh, uh, Left Day in Green, which oh, is a uh, wonderful nice read. And yeah. another journalist, uh, Columbia School of Journalism in Alan's case. Uh, and also a former member of the Liberation News Service, right. we talked about here. So uh, it'll be uh, every two weeks we'll have uh, book talks for the next month or so. So I hope you'll come back for Alan and Sigrid. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.